one of the main ideas uh, in the Indian uh, independence movement uh, is the concept of Swaraj, mm -hmm. which you deal with at uh, great length in your book. Uh, can you uh, uh, describe to us what does that mean exactly and what did it mean to the, uh, to the Indians at that time? <clears throat> well, you know, the word Swaraj um, at the time mostly meant uh, independence, uh, but it literally breaks down into two parts, Swa and Raj. Uh, swa means having to do with the self, of the self or about the self mm -hmm. and Raj means rule um, or mastery or control. So Swaraj is literally self-rule, um, which could be rule of the self or rule by the self. You know? So the self could be the subject of rule, it could be the object of rule. Um, it became the principal kind of political idea from the late 19th century into the middle of the 20th century in India. Uh, because it signified the ability of Indians to rule themselves uh, as opposed to being under British rule, British Raj. Um, so there was a kind of implicit opposition between Swaraj and British Raj. I see. Um, and Gandhi is the one who, uh, from about 1920 onwards, uh, really gave uh, a new kind of energy to this rather abstract concept. Um, by describing the various ways in which uh, the self could be defined and could um, achieve sovereignty vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the political regime which was in place, which was the colonial imperial regime of the British, uh, but also vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, smaller units of selfhood like the individual or the community um, or um, perhaps the nation itself. I see. The Raj, uh, the, the concept of rulership uh, of either of the self or of the community and society country, yeah. uh, a lot of those ideas, uh, I think, many of the Indian uh, leaders at that time took a lot from uh, uh, Western uh, liberal democracy. Yeah. But, this, but when it came to uh, this idea of establishing, exploring and establishing uh, ideas of the self. Yes. Uh, many of the, uh, the founding fathers, so to speak, of India, yeah. Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, Tagore brothers, they, they all looked for uh, a source uh, in different places. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about what, the, where they were looking? Yeah, I mean, you know, most, uh, most historical accounts of that period will tell you about the struggle for sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the independence movement or the nationalist movement or the anti-colonial mm -hmm. movement. Um, but, uh, you know, I try to argue in my book that there was a simultaneous search for the self uh, and to define the selfhood of India and of Indians. Um, in other words, what is this entity whose sovereignty we are struggling to achieve? Uh, you know, what is Indian self-rule the rule of? Exactly. Uh, so, in other words, what is India or, or what, what idea of India uh, is it uh, that defines the center of the struggle for sovereignty I between see. Indians and their foreign rulers? Um, and uh, the founders, uh, of which there were many, um, I particularly look at a few, um, I think had very interesting and innovative ways of trying to uh, understand this elusive uh, political, cultural, civilizational selfhood um, that could be uh, the kind of focus of their political project. Um, and Gandhi really did the most to define the Swa in Swaraj. Uh, in 1909, he wrote a small political tract called Hind Swaraj, which means Indian home rule mm -hmm. or Indian self rule. Mm -hmm. uh, Hind is the ancient word for India. Uh, and um, in that uh, tract, which kind of ended up becoming a sort of manifesto of subsequently for the nationalist mm -hmm. movement, um, you know, he tries to lay out um, his ideas of self and sovereignty, but also the basic lineaments of his uh, uh, plan for political struggle. Uh, which includes uh, ideas that at the time are fairly unconventional within the Indian context, 
um, civil disobedience, uh, passive resistance, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, a term that he coined uh, Satyagraha, uh, which was used crudely to translate passive resistance, uh, but um, he meant something actually quite innovative and complicated by that. I see. Uh, satyagraha means, uh, you know, seizing upon or grasping the truth, which is Satya. I see. Um, and so he insisted that there was um, uh, a certain value to the idea of truth uh, in the midst of a political struggle. Mm -hmm. And that truth became the connector, you could say, between the search for the self and the struggle for sovereignty. Um, and this is something that Gandhi was able to develop over the years throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s. And I believe um, <coughs> Gandhi uh, has written that uh, as his ideas of uh, civil disobedience and uh, political action evolved, uh, he, uh, this idea of Satyagraha, uh, he felt transcended uh, passive resistance. And uh, I, I believe yes. I remember reading somewhere that he considered passive resistance to be a weapon of the weak and Satyagraha to be a weapon of the strong. What, what did he mean by that? Well, he didn't like the connotation of passivity. Uh, in the idea of passive resistance uh, because in many ways um, he advocated an active engagement uh, with the problem of sovereignty uh, and with the with the self uh, and that activity could manifest itself you know as, as, a, as a quest for the truth um, and in order to engage properly in Satyagraha uh, you know, one had to prepare oneself um, uh, mentally, uh, psychologically, spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, but it also involved various kinds of uh, physical courage mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and uh, in many cases, uh, you know, bodily action. I see. Um, so, for example, um, a fast uh, or a refusal mm -hmm. to eat um, mm -hmm. in the service mm -hmm. of some political cause uh, could mm -hmm. also be a form of Satyagraha. I see. Or um, the famously, you know, he led a salt march uh, where um, Indians were basically being taxed uh, on salt. Mm -hmm. And he said salt is a basic commodity and a basic mm -hmm. part of human life. Uh, and this should be outside the purview of, uh, you know, a system of economic exploitation. So he led a long march. Uh, of, of followers mm -hmm. uh, to the ocean uh, and symbolically uh, picked up, you know, a handful of sand which was uh, laden with salt mm -hmm. uh, and said, this salt is ours and we claim it, right? Uh, but that very process of marching, which took several days mm -hmm. uh, and of, of uh, symbolically claiming the salt mm -hmm. uh, was also a kind of satyagraha. I see. Right? I see or uh, for instance striking <coughs> or demonstrating uh, uh, breaking um, you know a law uh, any kind of either individual or collective action mm -hmm. uh, which challenged state power um, could be cast as a form of I satyagraha see. I see. now um, <coughs> uh, gandhi used to obviously when uh, <coughs> in the 20s uh, 30s these ideas were obviously uh, all being uh, introduced to the masses and there mm -hmm. were massive political movements and mm -hmm. campaigns mm -hmm. uh, and in the heat of the battle so to speak mm -hmm. uh, in in uh, in actually conducting Satyagraha mm -hmm. uh, Gandhi would uh, oftentimes call off mm -hmm. the action uh, many times making many other Indian leaders at the time uh, perplexed mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. possibly angry at the time mm -hmm. what was he doing uh, what was he doing creating uh, non-action in the middle of uh, uh, conducting action? Yeah, you know, uh, Gandhi called all of his um, uh, different approaches over time in mm -hmm. South Africa and India. I mean, this was a long process of decades mm -hmm. of refining forms of political resistance. And he called these uh, experiments with truth. Again, truth being Satya that mm -hmm. we have at the center of mm -hmm. Satyagraha. Um, and he uh, believed that, uh, you know, uh, it was not simply enough to 
uh, resist oppression, mm -hmm. but that you had to do it in an ethical way uh, and you had to be in the right frame of mind while you were doing it. And so far as possible, even while being very actively engaged in mm -hmm. the idea and the practice of resistance, uh, so far as possible that resistant resistance should be non-violent. So you understand, there's a very mm -hmm. interesting new configuration where passivity is being rejected, but at the same time violence is also being rejected. So it's a kind of active uh, mode of non-violent engagement where the activity comes from, in fact, um, uh, you know, mental preparation uh, and, and, the, and the consolidation of your inner courage and your inner dedication to the truth. So when you had these political movements or mobilizations or these mass mm -hmm. campaigns, uh, first of all, many times, uh, you know, a, a, a large collection of human beings cannot always be micromanaged or controlled mm -hmm. uh, by a leader like Gandhi or by others. Mm -hmm. uh, so the action could go from nonviolent to violent, right? Mm -hmm. That was one instance in which Gandhi would call a halt and say, mm -hmm. no, it's not just that we have to resist in any which way, but we have to resist in the right way. So if we've crossed the line from, from nonviolence to violence, then it's better not to keep going down this route. It's better to step back, rethink our strategy and start again. Um, another, uh, you know, situation could be that um, uh, he felt that um, uh, many of his followers or people engaged in Satyagraha, Satyagrahis, mm -hmm. um, were not uh, sufficiently uh, prepared um, in their uh, mental spiritual stance. Um, in other words, that they had not fully actually understood, uh, you know, what it is that they were fighting for and how to carry on that fight. Uh, and in that case, he often advocated that instead of uh, you know, rushing into some conflict which could get, get out of hand and which may not yield the actual outcome mm -hmm. um, that you want mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the reaction of the state, uh, in terms of the response of the powerful entity, right? Uh, it would be better to engage in a whole range of other activities that he had defined as being useful uh, for, for uh, mm -hmm. developing the right spirit of Satyagraha and uh, dedicating oneself to the idea of Swaraj. And these, you know, actions included uh, uh, spinning and weaving, um, you know, hand, hand, uh, hand spun yarn. Uh, and was there a hadi. mental place to be w during these simple yeah. activities? These simple activities, you know, uh, involved, uh, well, a certain degree of mm -hmm. uh, uh, just sheer kind of mastery of uh, hardware, mm -hmm. you know, physical uh, control over your equipment. I see. For example, there's a very famous uh, documentary clip which shows Nehru, who was really, Jawaharlal Nehru was Gandhi's, you know, principal protege, you could say, and he ended up being the first Prime Minister of Free India. Um, so he goes into a Gandhian camp uh, and tries to sit at the spinning wheel mm -hmm. and make khadi, make cotton. Uh, and he's very bad at it. I see. You know, he can't do it because he's not used to doing it. So the point Gandhi was always making is that you have to do this thing mm -hmm. in an iterative, repetitive way. You have to keep on doing it. You have to do it in silence, in solitude. The mastery of a spinning, yeah. for instance, you is almost you know, you a metaphor for mastering yourself. Yeah. You can't just, you know, sit down at a spinning wheel like mm -hmm. Nehru did in this clumsy way. You won't be able I to see. spin like one inch of, uh, of, 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 the, of the yarn. So you have to be, um, you know, it has to be a kind of practice. I see. It has to be a meditative, mm -hmm. reflective practice. There has to be a degree of mastery I see. over your own, uh, you know, capacity to I do see. this action. I see. And Gandhi believed that in the mm -hmm. process of learning to do that and of doing it well, you know, you were also simultaneously achieving a higher order of self-mastery, which ultimately would make you uh, a more competent political actor, I see. you know, than someone who just rushed in there 
uh, with some idea that, that so he or she was fighting for the truth or the right cause. So it sounds like, I mean, the, the, the Indian action uh, movement for independence is almost like on a dual track. There's, on the one side, it's gaining political ground and political yeah. autonomy. And yeah. on the other side, there's also this drive to create self-awareness of what India should be or could be and what an Indian is. So it's right. like a dual track. And it's also what's interesting about this this quiet, reflective, mm -hmm. repetitive mm -hmm. type of action, which is also very physical, very basic, mm -hmm. and very, very simple, is that that's much harder for a government to regiment or control. I mean, it's not clear, you know, how this breaks any laws. Mm -hmm. It's not clear how this challenges anybody's authority. But at the same time, in a very subtle way, you know, it builds up a core of inner strength, which ultimately Gandhi believed would lead to a kind of tipping point where external structures of power would be forced to respond to this kind of groundswell of, of spiritual power mm -hmm. that the people were accumulating by um, doing these very simple tasks, which anyone can do. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an ideologue. You don't have to be a party worker. You don't have to be educated even mm -hmm. uh, in politics. Um, you don't even have to be in public life, actually, um, mm -hmm. you know, to prepare yourself um, mentally in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.